Well, tonight, I want to bring to you a message that deals with how God moves us from despair to dependence. How God moves us from despair to dependence. Turn in your Bibles to the book of 2 Samuel chapter 5. And I will read in your hearing verses 1 through 8. It reads, Then came all the tribes of Israel to David unto Hebron, and spake, saying, Behold, we are thy bone, we are thy bone, and thy flesh. Also in time past, when Saul was king over us, thou wast he that lettest out and broughtest in Israel. And the Lord said to thee, Thou shalt feed my people Israel, and thou shalt be a captain over Israel. So all the elders of Israel came to the king to Hebron, and King David made a league with them in Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed King David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years. In Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months. And in Jerusalem, he reigned 30 and three years over all Israel and Judah. And the king and his men went to Jerusalem unto the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, which spake unto David, saying, Except thou take away the blind and the lame, thou shalt not come in hither, thinking David cannot come in hither. Nevertheless, nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion. The same is the city of David. And David said on that day, Whosoever getteth up to the gutter, and smiteth the Jebusites, and the lame and the blind, that are hated of David's soul, he shall be chief and captain. Wherefore they said, The blind and the lame shall not come into the house. I want you to go with me to the book of Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 to 5. That's our companion text. Second Corinthians chapter 10. Verses 3 to 5. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and the bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Maybe I should say it this way. Today I'm about to bring you a message how you can overcome every stronghold in your life. Because God gives us the wisdom through His Word. Can you say amen somebody? Father, would you please... Anoint your servant as we speak and prompt each heart to be receptive, we pray. In the name of Jesus, we ask it. Amen. Poor Pete. Pete just sits on the street and leans against the wall. And if he could, he would literally beat his head against that wall. Because Pete has put his foot in his mouth. He always seems to say things, and after he says them, he lives to regret what he says. But this time, Pete said something to hurt the feelings of someone he really loved. So he's just there beating his head. He just can't seem to stop saying the wrong things. And then there is Joe. Joe doesn't have the problem that Pete has with his mouth. But Joe has a problem with his career. He tried to run the family business, but his own family fired Joe. And then another organization hired him. And they fired him. 
And that same organization charged him with some crimes. And now Joe is in prison with nothing to face but a bleak future. And then there is this woman. She doesn't have a tongue problem like Pete. And she doesn't have a career problem like Joe. But she's got a problem in the area of matrimony. She's been married and divorced so many times that the clerks down at the courthouse, they know her on a first name basis. Pete with his tongue problem. Joe with his career problem. And this woman with her marital problems. They are all dealing with something in their lives that seem impossible to overcome. Just can't get this one area of their lives together. Just can't get this monkey off their backs. Pete can get his mouth together. He's got foot in the mouth disease. Joe can get his career together. This woman can get her relationships together. This one area, this impossible area that they can't seem to pull together. Because they are facing what the Bible calls strongholds. And they are not something exclusive to the persons I just mentioned. We all have strongholds. We all have just one area in our lives that we can't seem to get together. For you, it might not be your marriage, your career, or your relationships. For you, it might just be the stronghold of worry has got a hold on you. You're not even hearing a word I'm saying right now because you're worrying about something. You just can't get a grip on it. For some of us, it might not be worry. It might just be in being so judgmental. We've got an area of our lives that we have a stronghold. Now, what is a stronghold? When you read 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5 and onward, verse 5 says, Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. A stronghold is anything that exalts itself in our minds. Pretending to be bigger or more powerful than God. And because of strongholds in our lives, many people have given up and have decided this is just the way it's going to be with me for the rest of my life. So anything we are wrestling with in our lives that is so huge, so titanic, so gargantuan that we say to ourselves, well, I can never overcome it. So I will just live with it. This is just the way I'm wired up, Pastor. That's just the way I am. That's the way my mama was, my daddy was. That's just the way it always is going to be for me. My brothers and sisters, a stronghold is a fort that's tall, that has impenetrable walls or impregnable, impregnable gates, and it's hard to get to. And we... Today, we may look holy, we may talk holy, we may act like we have it all together in our lives. If the truth be told, all of us are plagued with some stronghold in our lives. For those of us who've been walking in the way for a long time, we've learned how to put our strongholds on the back burner. But it's still burning. And they seem to be impenetrable, these strongholds. So we can't get to the stronghold. Now, strongholds have many manifestations. The first manifestation is obsessions. If you've got an obsession with something, that is probably a stronghold. What is an obsession? An obsession is a persistent, disturbing preoccupation with an unreasonable idea. If you've got an idea that you can't get out of your head, then what you're dealing with is a stronghold. It's an obsession. But there's another manifestation of a stronghold, and it's called compulsion. 
Strongholds are not only obsessions, but they are compulsions. They are irresistible, irrational impulses to act against one's own will. You don't want to do it, but you just find yourself, you've got to do it. You want to lose weight, and at midnight you got a craving to go to the refrigerator. You've made promises to yourself, I'm not going to do it. But you're acting against your own will. Doesn't make sense to spend, spend, and splurge, splurge. But there's a stronghold and you act against your will. We've got to learn how to act our wage. Y'all didn't get it. Uh -huh. Act your wage. Don't spend what you don't have. Amen, somebody. Uh-huh. Amen. I like this lady here. She'll make me preach. Yeah, tell her I like her. She didn't hear me. I like you. You say amen again. Yes, yeah, say amen. All right, good, good. You're going to make me preach. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make sense to drink, but here is a stronghold. You act against your own will. Because it robs you of being in control of yourself. And yet you'll go back to the bottle time and time again. You don't really want to do it. But you've got a stronghold in your life. The third manifestation of a stronghold is addiction. Which is a compulsive overpowering dependence on an object or a feeling resulting in a major life problem. Now, the first time that the word stronghold is used in the entire Bible is in reference to David. He had just been crowned king. He's 30 years old. And for seven and a half years, David has established the capital of Israel in the southern region of the kingdom, a place called Hebron. But the only problem with Hebron is that it's in the southern region. And David's goal is the goal of national unification. He wants to take these 12 scattered tribes and forge them into a united democracy. And he can't forge them into a united democracy, more accurately a monarchy, as long as the capital is in the south. The capital is in Hebron. And he must place the capital in a more centralized location. So David considers one place called Jerusalem. Jerusalem it's probably the most important and famous city in the world. It is in the city, it is a city not only of Christians, but a city of Jews, Christians, and Muslims. Jerusalem is a city on a hill that is surrounded by ravines and gorges. And it's a perfect place to have a capital because it's difficult to get to. It's impregnable. It's a stronghold. It's a city on a hill surrounded by walls. And it's inhabited by the Jebusites. That's interesting. Because if you read the history of David, you always read about David fighting the Amorites, the Philistines, the Galactites. No, I just made that one up. <laughs> or you read about the Philistines fighting against the Amorites. But you never hear anyone talk about fighting the Jebusites. Nobody even thinks about the Jebusites. Do you know why? The Jebusites live in Jerusalem up on a hill. It's a stronghold. And everybody just assumes you just leave the Jebusites alone because you can't win anyway. You can win anywhere else in Israel. But this one area, don't even try. But David, full of faith, said, I need a new place. The nation needs a new capital. And he ponders, why not Jerusalem? I'm sure his advisor said, what did you say, David? He said, I said cigarettes. He said, I said philandering. I said sex. I said gossiping. I said, Jerusalem, we've got success everywhere else. God has given us success in Felicia. 
God has given us success in other regions. Why not go after Jerusalem? And the Bible said, David set his heart on this stronghold called Jerusalem. Now what's your Jerusalem? You just assume you've got to be drunk, high, broke, defeated. You just assume that's the way I'm going to be for the rest of my life. And I meet people every day who have given up, who believe that they can't break that cycle. They can't change their lives. That tomorrow will not be better than today. It's just going to get worse. But I've got news for you, ladies and gentlemen. If you've got a stronghold, God is able. He's able. Oh, yes, he is. And based on this story, you can tell when you've got a stronghold. A stronghold is, first of all, a dated struggle. Mm -hmm. Notice these Jebusites had been up in Jerusalem for centuries. Nobody bothered them. And you know you've got a stronghold because whatever has occupancy in your life that you can't bring down, it's been there for a while. Can somebody say amen? Amen. Whatever your stronghold, it's really a stronghold, I guarantee you. It's something you've been wrestling with for years. In fact, you could probably go way back to childhood. This didn't just happen this year. It's a dated struggle. By the way, have you ever met old, cranky people? Well, they were young and cranky. Age doesn't make you cranky. You are who you are. Say amen, somebody. It's a dated struggle. Sometimes when preachers preach, you would hear the comment, how did you know that, Pastor? You were talking to me. Well, I don't know your life situation, but God does. See, you don't read God's word. God's word reads you. It's not only a dated struggle, but secondly, it's a difficult struggle. Oh, it's an obsession. Oh, it's a compulsion. Oh, it's an addiction. It's strong, and it's got a hold on you. And it's got somebody like that. If all of you were to come up on this pulpit and hold me down, there's no way I can get out of it. Hallelujah wouldn't get me out of it. I can shout and praise all I want. It would not get me out. Not only a dated struggle and a difficult struggle, but it is thirdly a discouraging struggle. Have you ever tried to live right and it just doesn't seem to come easy? Look at verse 6. When David and his men got outside Jerusalem, the Jebusites are in the stronghold. Stronghold, And it says, and the king and his men went to Jerusalem unto the Jebusites. The inhabitants of the land which spake unto David. They are up on the hill, up on the wall fence, and this is what they are saying. They are discouraging David. They said, David, except you take away the blind and the lame, thou shalt not come hither, thinking David cannot come in. In other words, David, you can't get in here, so we are not going to put our strong men on the wall. You know who we're going to put there? The blind men, the 89-year-olds, the ones who can't fight. Those are the ones we are putting on on on, on the wall to fight you, David, because you can't get up here. We don't have to put our best men here. In other words, what they were doing, they were trying to discourage David. And I'll tell you this, anytime you're trying to do right, the devil will find a way to discourage you. And you know you've got a stronghold when it's dated. You know you've got a stronghold when it's difficult and when it's discouraging you. Or you will always be drunk. There are people in your family, your kinfolk, who will not encourage you when you're trying to do right. Say amen, somebody. There are people who you believe love you, but they will not encourage you. They'll only discourage you. That's why you should not hang around negative people. Kahalath, the preacher in the wisdom literature says, anytime you're talking to negative people, you should be talking and walking. He says you should be walking away from them. I don't hang around negative folks. Say amen, somebody. Negative folk will suck the life out of you. 
Every time you try to do something right, every time you try to break your stronghold, all they can tell you, you've always been like this. Your mama was like this. Your daddy was like this. You will never change. And then the Bible says in verse 7, a 12-letter word, in spite of everything that happened, in spite of having a, an obsession and a difficult situation and a stronghold, the Bible says, nevertheless, listen to me, folk. When people tell you you can't, you should say, nevertheless. When people tell you it's impossible, you should say, nevertheless. When people tell you you'll always be what you used to be, say, nevertheless. It says, nevertheless, David took the stronghold. He's got something dated. Nevertheless, he took it. He's got something difficult. Nevertheless, he took it. He's got something discouraging, but nevertheless, he took it. And how many of you today need a nevertheless in your life? You were born into a family of alcoholics. Nevertheless, I'm going to stay sober. I never knew my daddy. But nevertheless, my children will know theirs. I'm running the streets. Nevertheless, I'm going to do something significant with my life. And guess what? God wants to put a nevertheless in your life. He wants to bring down some strongholds. And don't look at me like you don't have any strongholds. And don't tell me I've been a Christian for 40 years. That doesn't mean you don't have strongholds. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. In other words, Paul is saying to us here in the New Testament that if you've got strongholds, you don't have to live with them for the rest of your life. God can pull them down. And I believe, I believe the word of God. You can only pull them down. Listen to me, folk. When you've got the right weapons. Listen, spiritual things are spiritually discerned. Carnal things must be dealt with carnally. Uh-huh, listen to me. You've got to understand that the battleground is your mind. You've got to be careful what you allow in your mind. You've got to guard your mind. Amen, somebody? Every time I have sinned, it began right here. Amen, somebody. Every time I sin, it begins right here in my mind. The battleground is the mind. The battle gear is spiritual weapons. And the battle goal is to bring down your stronghold. You don't cuss your stronghold out. You don't try to get evil with your stronghold because we don't use carnal weapons. It's spiritual weapons. And the battle is to tear down your stronghold. And it can be torn down and you can occupy an area of your life that has had a grip on you for years if you engage spiritual weapons in your fight. And right here in this story, we find out what those spiritual weapons are. If you want to pull down those impossible areas of your life, first of all, you've got to hate your stronghold. And please don't act like you don't know how to hate. Amen, somebody. I don't know what it is that got a grip on you. You can't play with it. You can't flirt with it. You've got to hate what your stronghold is. And hate is an intense emotion. You've got to hate liquor. Hate drugs. Hate what it's doing to you. You've got to hate being friendless because you've got a bad attitude. I was preaching in Birmingham, England about 10 years ago, and I did the workers' meeting, and the pastors were asking me questions, and one of the questions, one pastor put up his hand. He said, Pastor, uh, uh, tell me, I've been in this conference for over a year now, and I've never received a call from not one pastor in this field. I said, man, I'm sorry to hear that. I said, but I got a question for you. How many pastors have you called 
in the year you've been here? None. He who would have friends must first show himself to be friendly. Say amen, somebody. Amen, somebody. And you got to hate being friendless. You got to hate it. You've got to hate your bad attitude. You've got to hate whatever that stronghold is in your life. You've got to hate it intensely. And don't act like you don't know how to hate. Verse 8 says, And David said on that day, Whosoever get it up to the gutter, and smite us the Jebusites and the lame and the blind that are hated of David's soul. That are hated of David's soul. You've got to hate what your life looks like. Every change in your life begins with you hating what you are. I want to lose weight. I don't have to be skinny like the woman in the magazines. But I want to lose weight for my own health. I want to walk and not be losing my breath. So I begin by hating the way I feel. I hate it. So I'm going to make incremental, small changes. I'm going to bring down that stronghold. Say amen, somebody. David hated the Jebusites. And if you've got a stronghold in your life, you've got to hate it. Nothing will change until you hate being pitiful, messed up, drunk, high, stupid, crazy, and goofy. Talk to your stronghold. I hate you. I hate what you're doing to me. I hate what you're doing to my family. I hate what my home looks like. I hate what our relationship feels like. I hate it. I hate what you're doing to my body. I hate what you're doing to my relationships. You've got to hate it because no stronghold comes down until you hate being the way you are. You've got to hate being down all the time. Hate being defeated all the time. Hate falling into the same trap all the time. Hate being used by men all the time. Hate not feeling good about yourself. Being used and think that's the way to receive love. I hate being used. Because I'm seeking love. I hate it, I hate it, I hate it. And then secondly, you've got to not only hate your stronghold, but you've got to turn a deaf ear to discouraging voices. If you're going to bring down any stronghold in your life, you've got to get away from people who will tell you you can't. You've got to claim the promise of Jesus. I can I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Nothing with God is impossible. All things are possible. Get away from discouraging voices. And then David, we are told, ignores all the negative voices and begins to tear down his strongholds. Because some, for some strange reason, there are people who feel like they have an advantage over you when you're messed up. Do you know there are some people who enjoy, literally, knowing that you are messed up? Makes them feel better. But that's like me throwing acid in Denzel Washington's face and hoping that I get better looking. You've got to ignore the negative voices. There's a passage of scripture in Mark chapter 5 and verse 40. Jesus, we are told, was getting ready to raise a 12-year-old girl from the dead. And everybody started laughing at Jesus. Do you know, anytime you start doing something miraculous in your life, there will be people who will laugh and scorn. Jesus is about to heal a girl. But look at what it said. When they began laughing at Jesus... It says, but when Jesus had put them out. Listen to me, folk. He's getting ready to go into the house. And he's saying, I'm going to raise this girl. And they're laughing at him. His critics were laughing him to scorn. I could preach a whole sermon right here. Have you ever been rolled out? They rolled Jesus out. They laughed him to scorn. But it says, when he, Jesus, had put them out. He said to them, you got to get out of the way. 
You're standing in my way. You're a stumbling block to my miracle. You're a voice that I will not heed. He kicked them out. And you got to kick some people out of your life. Let me tell you something. Your happiness quotient can go up and skyrocket tonight if you kick certain people out of your life. They're not good for you. <laughs> First time you read about Jesus putting folk out was when somebody tried to discourage him from doing what God called him to do. And anytime you've got somebody in your life who might be trying to discourage you from doing what God called you to do, you've got to put them out. First, you've got to hate it. Number two, you've got to turn a deaf ear to discouraging voices. Number three, you've got to develop a support system. It's all in the text. Verse 8 says, and David said on that day, whosoever get it up to the gutter. He's talking to others. And you've got to find somebody, kindred spirits, that hate your stronghold as much as you hate your stronghold. And can become a part of your support system. Say amen, somebody. I have at least five people that I can call at any time of day or night around the country who I can talk to, who I can be myself with. When I'm frustrated, I can talk to them in a frustrated voice. When I'm happy, I can share my happiness. When I'm sad, when I'm troubled, when I feel hopeless, there are people I can talk to. And everybody needs somebody. Stop telling your business to everybody who would listen. And can I speak to, to wives a little more specific? Stop telling all your business to all your girlfriends about your marriage and the troubles in your marriage. Talk to the Lord. Talk to your husband. Talk to a professional. Stop telling all your girlfriends. That's why most men don't like their wives' best friends. Do you know why? Because they know she knows or they know everything about him. Talk too much. Some things you must keep to yourself. And some things you must only talk to certain people about. Whatever is going on in your marriage, talk to the Lord. Talk to him or talk to her. And then go to a professional. But stop telling everybody. It's not their business. First of all, they can't help you. Their lives are just as messed up as yours. <laughs> and misery loves company. But you got to have some friends who will hold you accountable. We can bring down our strongholds if one day every person in this church just came into this building and put every stronghold at the altar. Because there is power in prayer. Number one, you've got to hate it. Number two, you've got to turn a deaf ear. Number three, you've got to have a support system. Number four, focus on the gain and not the pain. Because most of the things we want in life, we don't want to work at it. We want to just receive it. The only thing you receive is salvation. Say amen, somebody. Everything else in life, you got to work at it. David said in verse 8, And whosoever get it up to the gutter and smites the Jebusites and the lame and the blind that are hated of David's soul, he shall be chief and captain. David was saying, if I can get somebody to get this stronghold, you're going to be the captain of my army. If you read 2 Chronicles, you will discover the person who did it was a guy by the name of Joab. And Joab becomes the captain of, da captain of David's army because he said, I know it's going to be difficult, but if I can bring this stronghold down, look at what I'm going to get. I'm going to be the captain of the army. What you've got to keep telling yourself is it's a difficult stronghold, but if I can bring this thing down, I'm going to be the captain of my life. The devil is not going to control me anymore. He's not going to control my future. He's not going to control my emotions. He's not going to control my family and my destiny. But I just got to get this one area of my life together. And don't look at me like you don't have one area of your life. You've got to get together. Think about how much money you can save when you learn how to manage yourself and your money. Think about how I'm going to be together when I... Quit getting manipulated by men. Think about how tough I can be when I can 
Say no to meanness and greed and envy and lust and jealousy and ugly pride and this competitive spirit. Think about how bad I'm going to be when I get this stronghold down. Think about how happy and peaceful you'll be when your mind is no longer messed up because of what folk are saying about you. Or being disturbed and upset because certain folk don't like you. Big deal. You don't have to like me. I'm going to praise God anyway. I like me a lot. Think about how great it's going to be. Just go ahead and imagine that your stronghold has been defeated. You've got to hate it. Turn a deaf ear. You've got to have a support system. You've got to focus on the gain and not the pain. And finally, you've got to try a new approach. Listen to me. The problem is you've been trying just one approach. Problem is, most of us have not tried anything new in a long time. The reason no one could bring down Jerusalem was because everybody was trying to go up over the walls. And nobody could do it. And they were laughing at David and saying, we will put the blind and the crippled to guard the walls. But then David, because the Holy Ghost is creative. And when you are in tune with God... The Holy Spirit will say there are more ways besides just one way of bringing down a stronghold. So guess what David said? We can't go over the walls, but when you are determined, God will put things in your mind. He said, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's a gutter, and that's where water comes in. And if water can come and get in, maybe we've been doing this thing the wrong way. Maybe instead of going up over the walls, maybe we need to get down in the gutter. Maybe there's a new approach I need to be open to. And you need to say, God, any way you want to bless me, any way you want to lead me, anything you want to do with me, you can be reckless with me. Have your way. We can't scale the walls, but maybe we could get up in the gutter. And if you do that, your strongholds will come down. And verse 10 says, and David went on and grew great. And the Lord of hosts was with him. And you will continue to grow great if you bring down that one stronghold. So if it's heartache, God will put a nevertheless in your heartache and get you through it. If it's depression, God will put a nevertheless and you'll move beyond it. If your stronghold is what somebody says about you. God will put a nevertheless in that stronghold and you'll rise above it. If it's regret, God will put a nevertheless in that stronghold and you'll leave it behind you. If it's grief, God will put a nevertheless and you'll live through it. If it's disappointment, you will soar above it. If it's abuse, you will find joy in spite of it. If it's betrayal, God will put a nevertheless and you will climb from underneath it. If it's abandonment, God will put his nevertheless there and you'll prosper in spite of it. If they knock you down, God will put a nevertheless in your stronghold and you'll jump back up. If they lied on you, God will put a nevertheless there and you will keep on marching in truth. If somebody cheated on you, God says, let me put a nevertheless there and you'll get double for your trouble. Whenever God puts a nevertheless there and you live by those principles, your strongholds will come tumbling down David's dead and now David is occupying an area that nobody else could occupy I want you to know my brothers and sisters if God promised you victory over your weakness he is enough strength for every defeat in your life say amen somebody mm -mm -mm -mm. This is not some generic sermon. This is mail that has your name on it. David did. He overcame. And so did Pete. You remember Pete? Pete had a stronghold with his mouth. Kept putting his foot in his mouth. But God put a nevertheless in his stronghold. And guess what happened to Pete? He got up. From leaning against the wall. And Pete was forgiven. His friend forgave him. And a few days later. Pete. Whose name was Peter. Turned right around. And on the day of Pentecost. 
preached the first Christian sermon in the book of Acts. And the 3,000 souls were added to the church. And do you remember Joe? He had a stronghold with his career. But God put a nevertheless in his stronghold. And Joseph, who was fired by his brothers, worked for Potiphar, was thrown in jail. But God put a nevertheless in his stronghold in the book of Genesis. And Joseph, in the area of defeat, became prime minister over all of Egypt. And do you remember that woman who couldn't seem to keep her marriage together? You remember that woman at the well? Everybody knew her down at the courthouse. She had been married so many times. Jesus came by, put a nevertheless in her well. She had men problems. But after Jesus gave her the nevertheless, the Bible says she went back to the men and said, Come see a man that told me everything I've ever done. Surely this must be the Christ. Just to show. As Jesus put a nevertheless in Peter's life and Joe's life and this woman's life and David's life, right now, he want to, wants to whip your stronghold out of your life. He wants to put a nevertheless in your life. I want everybody to stand because tonight, tonight I want you to do something. I want you to demonstrate to the Holy Spirit and to the God in heaven who is with us even now that everything that has defeated you, you will surrender to Jesus right now. Everything that has sucked the life out of you and made you miserable in the past, you're going to surrender to Jesus right now. Whether it's a habit, a relationship, a tendency to worry, or you just have grief in your life, nothing seems to go right, I want you to come to this altar and I want you to surrender it to Jesus. I'm not going to beg you. If you mean business with Jesus, get out of your seat. Come to this altar and surrender it to Christ right now.